I just wanted to welcome everybody. Um, I know some of you, but it's great to see all of you. My name is Lisa Levine and I'm the Director of Education for Dementia Alliance of North Carolina. If you're not familiar with our organization, we cover all 100 counties in North Carolina, providing care, services, resources, and education to families living with dementia. And um, our goal is to uh, get people living with dementia and across the state of North Carolina the best quality of life that we can. Um, we are going to record this this evening, so just wanted to let you know in case you need to turn off your camera, though I know Melanie likes to see your faces so she can gauge your response when she's speaking. Um, so a little quick housekeeping for you. The internet in this area has been glitchy today. So we've got a couple people as co-hosts, so hopefully nothing drops. Um, just in case it does, we will invite you to come back and do this again when the internet is not a problem, but hopefully that will not be an issue. And um, I did want to thank really quickly ESI and Aware Senior Care. They are our corporate sponsors, and so they help us prevent. Uh, they help us have events like this for for free, for no cost for all of you. We will send out Melanie's slides for her presentation after the event. It will probably be tomorrow before I can get that to you. Um, and so bear with me. And then if there's any other information that comes up in the chat resources and that kind of thing, we'll share that with you. One other quick bit of information, if you're not used to Zoom, if you look at the bottom of your screen, there's little words across the bottom. If you see the chat bubble, you can click on that and you can type in. And I know Melanie's gonna ask you questions, so um, get your fingers ready to work a little bit. And with that, Melanie, I'll turn it over to you and let's talk about types of dementia. Thanks so much, Lisa. It's, um, it's so wonderful um, to be here with a room full. The only thing that would make me happier would be if you were in my room full. Um, but I'm so glad that, you know, we, we complain about Zoom, but more than likely, some of y'all wouldn't fly to North Carolina and be with me. So I'm glad I'm still able to be with you in this. And I'm really curious. Um, I'm going to ask people to just use that chat feature. Um, down there at the bottom, it's a little speech bubble kind of thing. Use that chat feature and just drop in where you're from, where you're from in North Carolina, where you're from in other parts of the United States. Um, so just drop in there where you're from and we'll, we'll kind of might make some connections that way as well. So I see lots of mountains kind of area, lots of right um, um, Raleigh kinds of area, Staten Island, we, we did a facilitator training this morning and had two women from New York and a woman from Florida, I think. So um, it, it's, it's nice to have people from different places. Chapel Hill, my son is in Chapel Hill right now. He's an undergraduate, he's a freshman at UNC. Lots of people from New York, um, Wilmington, Kinston, Greensboro, Wilmington, um, Naples, Florida. I'm sure I missed some others, uh, but a whole range of people. And now you found that chat. So now I know at least 30 of y'all know how to use the chat. So if I say respond to me in the chat, you have no excuse because you have proved that you can respond to me in the chat. Yeah, I am sneaky. Y'all didn't know that about me. I am sneaky. So thanks for doing that. So we have an hour to talk about something that I could probably talk about for 10 hours and, and people besides me have talked about it for 10 hours um, or more. And so we're going to really kind of spend a bit of time kind of discussing the basics, kind of getting everybody to the same page and everybody to the same place on this idea of different kinds of dementias. And then I'm gonna try really, really hard um, to reserve some time at the end, specifically on questions about different types of dementia. So if you have a question, you wanna make sure your question gets answered, go ahead and drop that into 
the chat or drop that into um, yeah into the chat. It looks like go ahead and drop that into the chat. We'll make sure your question gets answered first, and then if we have time left after we answer those different diagnosis questions, we'll get to some of those other broader um, kinds of questions that people might have as well. So that's a little bit about how we're going to spend our time together. I'm going to start sharing my screen. You know, I don't get paid if I don't have a PowerPoint. Nobody think it used to be if you, um, you, you're only considered a consultant if you drive more than 50 miles and you have AV equipment. So now it's like you're only considered, you know what you're talking about if you share a PowerPoint. So I'm going to share the mandatory PowerPoint and, but we're going to spend a lot more time talking um, then we are just looking at a PowerPoint. So this is our wonderful Dementia Alliance of North Carolina with the tagline of engage, educate, and empower. And I, I love that approach. This is our Q&A on different types of dementia. So for those of you who haven't been to one of these, we started out doing just Q&As and we would have the range of topics was just so broad. We got a little more focused on them. So this one is specifically about types of dementia. Um, so we're going to start by talking about um, just a couple of things that are true about dementia. And, and there are some things that are true just to have the understanding of someone having dementia there are a couple of characteristics that have got to be true. One thing that's true is that anybody who has dementia is going to have changes in two or more of their brain functions. So it's not an isolated memory problem or an isolated language problem. If there's only one thing that we are concerned about, it's not dementia. So that's one thing that's important about dementia. The second thing that's really important about dementia is it changes across time. So where you are today, you're going to be in a different place in a month or in a year. And it's associated with a kind of an ongoing decline or loss of, of skill and ability. The other thing that's true about all of the dementias is that they are terminal, meaning that um, people, dementia will eventually impact so much of the parts of the brain that people can't continue to meet their needs for life um, because of, of the significant changes in the brain. So those are kinds of the, the things that are true about dementia. But more importantly than that is dementia is a condition that's part of the brain of people. And because of that, since every single one of us is different and every single person with dementia is different, everybody's life is gonna be different. Everybody's progression is gonna be different. Everybody's experience and journey is going to be different. So there are some similarities on these patterns. There are these patterns of change from complex to simple. So what I mean by that is for the majority of people living with dementia, the losses that they experience occur from things they learned last to things they learned first. So let me give you an example. Um, I, I mentioned um, a few minutes ago, I have a son who's a freshman in college. And when my son who is a freshman in college was learning to eat, what were the first tools that he used? Hold them up in the air. These were the first tools he used. Was he very good with them? He was terrible with them. He was absolutely terrible with them. Was I thrilled that he was having struggles with these tools? Yes, because I was a mother for the first time at 40 years old and everything he did was amazing and wonderful. So I was thrilled that he was dropping Cheerios. Guess who else in my house was thrilled he was dropping Cheerios? The little dog was also thrilled that he was dropping Cheerios. Everybody in my family is, ha is happy. He got more skilled. He became able to use a, a spoon. Was he very good at using a spoon? No, he was terrible at using a spoon. Was I still thrilled? 
Yes, I was still thrilled that he was using a spoon. Was the little dog still thrilled? Yes, the little dog, she liked yogurt as well. Yay. He got more skilled and now he's using, you know, he was using a fork. He was using a fork and a knife. He's now in college. Most of the time he uses a napkin. And, and most of the time he chews with his mouth closed. Oh, somebody's got on a Carolina sweatshirt, I think. Paige, do you have on a Carolina sweatshirt? Um, yeah, go heels. Um, most of the time he, he does pretty well. So that's the way he built those skills. So for most people living with dementia, they will lose those skills in the opposite way. So they'll lose those skills from complicated down to simple. So they may not be able to use, you know, two tools, but they can still use one tool. They may not be able to use the spoon, but they can still use the tools that they came with. The challenge is we don't, we don't celebrate those. We, we often don't celebrate those preserved abilities, those things that person can still do. So part of why I, I believe in this, thinking about what type of dementia the person has is really important is so I, as a care partner, can really focus on what are the potential preserved skills. So I'm not all focused about what's lost. I can be focused on what I have. So do that with me. What do, put your hand here, what's lost. I can pay attention to what we've still got. Because I can't do, once something is lost, I can't do anything about it. I lost a necklace in high school. I'll never have it again. It's gone. I don't have it. I can grieve it. I can, I feel sad about it, but I don't have it. You know, I have something else that's precious. I've got it. I need to enjoy that and pay attention to it and, and kind of let go of some of the things that are lost. So we start to think about this idea that all dementia share preserved abilities and losses. The big difference is going to be what are those preserved abilities and what are those losses as we think about the different types of dementia. So let's look at a little bit, um, a different way of kind of looking at the relationships between dementia and Alzheimer's disease. So I've been doing these talks for a while and I have been um, talking about the difference between dementia and Alzheimer's disease. And if you look at this image, what you see is also dementia is the umbrella, which means dementia is the category. And underneath that category, oops, I didn't mean to do that. Underneath that category um, of dementia are all the different, not all of them, but boxes that represent all of the different conditions that cause dementia. So these underneath the, the umbrella are the diseases. Dementia is the syndrome. So we could change the names. If we changed the dementia to infection, then the boxes underneath would include things like viruses and bacteria and funguses and those kinds of things. If we were to change it to cancer, then we would change the boxes underneath to um, lung cancer or mass cancers or blood cancer. We, we'd have different categories, but that's the relationship. So Alzheimer's doesn't cause dementia or dementia doesn't get bad and turn into Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's disease is actually one type of dementia. That's important because when I start thinking about Alzheimer's disease, I think about three categories of change. And I think about changes in memory, changes in mobility, changes in mood and relationships. The biggest circle here is memory. And that's not because it's the only one, it's not because it's the most important one, but it's kind of the key outstanding. First one we often notice and notice that we're noticing. I, I might say with Alzheimer's disease, there might be some changes that are happening before the memory change happened, we just don't really notice them as much. 
Um, but the first one we often notice we change, the one that hits all of the commercials. So if you watch commercials, you're going to see Alzheimer's disease when we start talking about dementia and memory. Um, memory is a big part, but it's not the only thing, but it is important. So the kinds of memory change I see with Alzheimer's disease is often initially um, an issue of storage, not retrieval. So often what I'll notice is the person has trouble getting new information in and they're still left with all the old information. So if you're having trouble getting new information in and you're left with the old information, how well do you adapt to change? And I'm truly asking that. That's not a rhetorical question. You can drop it in the chat, how you think people react to change. You can show me with using a reaction of how well do you think people living with dementia, with Alzheimer's type dementia respond to change. You can put the crying, smiling, laughing emoji. Um, but how do you think people living with dementia, with Alzheimer's type, um, who can't get new information in, how do they do with change and things that are different? So drop it in the chat or, or show me with the emoji. Ellen's got a, an open mouth emoji. I think that's the same place mine was going. Um, and, and people are starting to put things in. So things like not well, they hate change, angry and confused. Lots of questions and anxiety, overwhelmed, frustrated and easily upset. And it feels like often people in these early stages are getting really rigid, not well, absolutely. And people who never like change are really now liking change, not liking change. And that's Lewy body, that's not Alzheimer's disease, anxiety. So what we're talking about is people who can't get a new information and life is starting to get really complicated. So then it starts to escalate up and how well does your brain work when you're distressed? Does it work really well? Yeah, I love what Sue's do. Yeah, putting it down. Your brain doesn't work. So we've got somebody with dementia, with Alzheimer's disease, who's have trouble getting new information in, and now they're feeling anxious and stressed, and the people around them don't get that they're having changes. So they tell them things like, try harder, concentrate, pay attention. So if I look at any one of you and you're trying to, let's say you're trying to, okay. Do you remember the first time you went on Zoom? Yeah, some of y'all are rolling your eyes. I see nods of, of understanding. So if somebody was with you the first time you went on Zoom and say, now you can try harder. I know you can do it. Now, if you would pay attention, you would be, I've already told you that once. No, you've already asked that question before. I told you the, how to do that before. You wouldn't like me very much, would you? So take a deep breath and let it go. Because one of the most critical things with all people living with dementia with people living with Alzheimer's disease, particularly is let go of needing to be right. And let go of needing to tell them about their mistakes and explaining their mistakes to them. Because early on, it's that they can't get the new information in, they're left with the old information. But it's not just about memory, that pattern kind of follows through. So people start to lose, that people learn words, learn words, learn words, lose words, lose words, lose words with Alzheimer's disease. People learn impulse control, learn impulse control, learn, and lose that kind of frontal lobe function. So when I said towards the beginning that I think some of the changes that we miss with Alzheimer's disease are, are some of those mood changes, some of those frontal lobe, executive function, organizing things, putting things together. Um, and we're gonna talk about some of those others as we go into some of the other parts of dementia or other Mr. types. Question? Yes. Um, when you talk about uh, not emphasizing what they don't remember, there are some things which uh, you somehow feel if you tell them enough times, maybe I'll remember something. I mean, it's not that they don't remember anything, is it? Or once in a while, something gets through. So if yeah. you never remind them of stuff that they uh, forgot or should have done, then how are, you, how are they gonna get any new information in? 
So that's a great question, Bernie, because there is this inconsistency because I say they don't get new stuff in, they don't get new stuff in, but then there's that one thing that they get in. And that one thing that they get in is often really emotional. So it's something about a really, something that blows up, something that's a really big appointment that they missed and everybody gets upset. And then every time you turn around, are we going to that appointment? When is that appointment? I've got to go get the taxes. It went really bad. Um, and so the things that tend to stick are things that are very emotional. We can't plan, we can't predict at what does stick, the kinds of new memories that people do hold on to are emotional memories. And so if our relationship becomes try harder, concentrate, pay attention, then I stop liking you. And if I stop liking you, and I'm not speaking specifically to Bernie, I'm speaking to you generically, because um, I, I love Bernie and, and we've been, we've known each other for, it feels like years now, Bernie. Um, it, so it's not about, because who wouldn't like Bernie? I mean, look at that face. Um, so it's not about you, it's about, I don't like this situation. So then that tends to put less and less able to kind of stick, to kind of stay um, in place. So this is Alzheimer's disease. Um, I'm gonna send this to Lisa, she'll send it out. This is pretty much what we've been talking about. I do wanna mention um, just briefly that there are people who have young onset Alzheimer's disease who start showing changes in symptoms in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s. And their road is quite different because social security often is not really excited to hear from a 30 year old with Alzheimer's disease. You know, it's, it's a hard road in a different way, developmentally, family-wise, um, work-wise, becomes really complicated in a different way. But we can't just think of Alzheimer's disease as being 70, 80, 90 year olds anymore. It's become much more broad than that. Um, I'm gonna send this so you'll have these kinds of things. Thinking about losses and preserved abilities Preserved abilities are things like how things used to be and motor memories, how to do things and then emotional memories. And we, we've talked a little bit about that already, but we can use that if I love Lisa and she's been a long friend of mine. And so when I see somebody who reminds me of Lisa, I look at Arlene and she's got kind of brown hair and she's got glasses on and she reminds me a little bit of my dear Lisa, that emotional memory might make Arlene able to do some things that maybe somebody else might not be able to do. So let's move on because we've got lots of other types of dementia, vascular dementia. If you look at these circles, you know, I kind of lied to you because I told you the one was gonna be bigger. And in this one, they're all pretty much the same size. And that's because with vascular dementia, the changes that we're going to see are really very dependent on where in the brain the damage is. So the damage might be big damages, like a big stroke somewhere, and, and it's very classic, and we have immediate kind of change in function, or we might be having little strokes all through the brain that kind of build up to have enough of a change that now we've got something that we can really see and measure. People with vascular dementia, it's often really associated with diabetes, with high blood pressure, with heart disease. So something that interferes with the circulation in the brain because it's not a brain cell disease. It's a resource in the brain disease. It's related to the inflammation in the blood, in the blood vessels, the lack of resources the blood vessels provide. And so what we see is really inconsistent, spotty, kind of all over the place kind of symptoms. So for people with vascular dementia, they don't follow that like this pattern. They're much more, who knows? So they might have the ability to understand more language than they can speak. They might have really good days when they're energized and can do stuff and days when they can't initiate anything at all. They might have days where they remember stuff and it's there and then days where it, 
they just can't get that kind of stuff out. So it's very erratic. So the pattern, if Alzheimer's looks like this, vascular dementia looks like this, plateau, plateau, change, little bit of improvement, plateau, plateau, change, maybe a little bit of improvement, plateau, plateau, change. So it's much more stepwise classically in kind of its progression. So that's a little bit about that, that vascular disease. If, if this, the changes that the person's having are right here in their frontal lobe, you might see a lot of impulsivity and trouble planning. If it's a lot in their temporal lobe where language is, you might see a lot of language struggles. If it's across the sensory motor strip, you might see a lot of mobility kind of stuff. If it's in, and this deep part is often um, really common, um, you, you might have memory problems and you might have um, memory problems, but it, it's more erratic kind of thing. One of the questions um, is, okay, so looking back at the couple of things, accused her and paranoid when she can't remember doing something. So she can't remember doing it or she can't remember telling you to do it. We actually are going to have some more of these really digging in to some of that communication relationship building. Um, the quick and easy answer to that question is I'm sorry. You know, I'm so sorry you're going through this. I'm so sorry it feels like I'm things aren't making sense. I'm so sorry the world isn't working. I'm so sorry. Um, then on with um, vascular dementia, anybody with dementia can have hallucinations. Now, vascular is not the most common one to have hallucinations with, um, but people with vascular dementia can have hallucinations. It's, it's like I said, it's not as common but it's possible. So let's go back to what will be on the PowerPoint that you'll get. Um, we, we've talked about this. Um, we've talked about this a little bit, the emotion and energy um, kind of fluctuations. Um, the one other thing I want to say about vascular dementia is they can have this emotional lability where they're all inside and then they're fine. And then they're frustrated and angry, and then they're fine. So this this kind of roller coaster of emotion, um, it, it's like the it's like the regulator is gone. It's like the thermostat is gone, and it's like one minute the heat is on, the next minute the air conditioner is on. I love you. I love you. I love you. The most wonderful person, you huzzy tramp. And and it can be you know just that quick that that it can happen. Melanie, do you find that people with vascular dementia often have hallucinations? Well, that was a question I, I thought I was just responding to that sometimes they do. Yeah, sometimes they do. Any type of dementia can have hallucinations. It's not the most common one for hallucinations. Um, thank you for, for, for scoping those out, those questions out for me, Lisa. Yeah. I've missed them a lot of times. So sometimes it's not the one, if someone comes and the first thing they tell me about is hallucinations, I, I may not initially think vascular dementia, um, but anything is possible, brains are complicated. If you say hallucinations, I'm going to think Lewy body dementia because it's one of the, the real um, common symptoms of Lewy body dementia is hallucinations and partnering with that nightmares. Um, a lot of people with Lewy body, the first thing that pe they noticed, people noticed before anything else was kind of a pattern of nightmares. So they, they have nightmares and hallucinations. Um, the memory problems are often really fluctuating. So a guy with Lewy body told me, um, my memory is like a bouncing ball. Sometimes I can catch it and sometimes I can't. So that real, sometimes they can do stuff, sometimes they can't. The other one that I wanted to make sure we talked about with Louie body, and that's why I put it in a big blue circle, is mobility. Because people with Louie body most often present with changes in movement and changes in thinking simultaneously or within a very short period of time, within a month or two or three months, they're having mobility problems and they're having memory problems. That's one of the distinguishing characteristics between Parkinson's disease, dementia, 
and Lewy body dementia is with Parkinson's disease dementia. There's a really clear, the person has had Parkinson's for a while and now their thinking is changing versus someone who you get that double whammy all at one time where there's mobility problems and there's thinking problems and it's happening at the same person. So the kinds of mobility problems might be big mobility, like things like falls. So things like people who um, haven't fallen in years and now all of a sudden it's the kitchen and it's the bathroom and it's getting into the, out of the car, out of the car and walking where there's nothing to fall over. There's not, not going downstairs and tripping. It's just kind of walking and falling. It can be going downstairs and tripping as well, but they're just these, these common kind of falls that people have. So mobility can be one, it can be big mobility like falls. It can be big mobility like swallowing. So it might be the first change that people start to realize is kind of choking and swallowing is what you notice first with anybody. It might also be tiny little movement problems. So a little bit like a, um, a tremor kind of Parkinson's, but often both sides instead of the one side. The other thing that can be is the stiffness and the not really being able to move. So I'm a nurse, I used to do home health and, and I got a call to go see somebody and he was, um, he was leaning against the wall like this. So his head was here, his feet were here, there was a chair underneath him and he was absolutely like an ironing board. He got in that position, he got stuck his wife couldn't get him up. She couldn't get him down. He was just leaning against the wall, stuck. So we were finally together able to move him off of the wall and move him to um, a, a, a recliner where we were able to kind of get him into a reclining position. He was absolutely stuck. So that's a little bit about Louis body. The one thing I wanna make sure I mention about Louis body is if I try to, as a clinician, I'm a nurse practitioner, when I used to prescribe, if I tried to give medicines to help with this mobility stuff, I often made those hallucinations and those thinking problems a lot worse. If I tried to give stuff to manage the hallucinations and the thinking problems, I made the mobility problems a lot worse. So these are people who really struggle um, to get that balance of how that's why we do so much better with non-medication approaches with with looking at how do we change the environment how do we change our approaches how do we use other kinds of responses besides medication and reserve those medications um for when um we have people with with hallucinations delusions um that we can't manage in other ways and then those people absolutely we need to they need to be on them you know standard as prescribed we need to be really thoughtful and careful and intentional about that so that's a little bit about Louie body you'll have some other information that comes on there a little bit about the medications and also some things to try that'll help people who are stuck or having some struggles and um, music is really one of the biggest gifts for people with Louis body for, for human beings, um, but it can really help people who are stuck kind of get moving. So the last one I'm gonna talk about, trying really hard to hold on to some, some time um, for some of those questions and I'm gonna pause myself um, and check in with my, my wonderful colleague and long-term friend. Um, Lisa, is there anything in the chat? Cause when I don't, when I'm sharing my screen, I can't see the stinking chat. <laughs> well, um, Janice asked if a person could have a combination of different types of dementia. And I did say yes to that, but I'm sure you have a more involved answer. Well, you were right, Lisa. Uh, says, yes, yes. yes. And, and I actually even have a slide for that. So, okay, um, great. And the, then um, Bernie had a good question. So is there a specific part of the brain that's associated with Lewy body? And I might tack on to that. Is that a different part of the brain than with Alzheimer's or frontotemporal dementia? Yeah, and Lewy body is kind of a type of cell and it's a type of cell that is a lot in the sensory motor strip, but it's throughout the brain. So it's, it's kind of parallel that, um, 
it's it's throughout the brain like Alzheimer's disease, but it's focused in some particular areas and some particular kinds of changes. Okay. And also, do you find um, more aggression in any particular form of dementia than any other? I know sometimes people with Lewy body dementia act out in their sleep, so that might be considered aggression. Yeah. Um, but do you find any um, other dementias have more aggressive behaviors? Yeah, the one that's kind of known for that is the, the alcohol-related dementia which is like Wernicke syndrome. Um, I'm probably mispronouncing it, but it's, you can find it. Um, the, the dementia that's associated with alcoholism is really common with that kind of unprovoked um, distress, high level of physical distress is, is the one that um, is most consistently and commonly. Most of the time for people living with dementia, and we probably will have some sessions on this, um, most of what creates that situation is a reaction to something. It's a reaction to something in the environment, or it's a reaction to um, to care. You know, I I'm trying to help the person get cleaned up, so I'm trying to take their pants off. But this is not a person who's used to taking their pants off and doesn't want to take their pants off. And I don't like having hands around my middle. So I'm I, a lot of times what we call aggression or combative or resisting is really people trying to protect themselves. Um, and, and so when we start to frame it that way as people are trying to protect themselves or they're trying to communicate an unmet need, um, then it, it kind of changes our understanding of who needs to change, that it's not them that needs to change, it is us and the environment and the approaches that need to change. Wonderful questions, thank yeah, you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we've got another question in there that I think we'll wait until the end that um, okay. I, you may talk about, so. Okay, so the next one is, um, this one I got sneaky on you and I added another circle. And the other circle I added was a circle for language. and all dementias have impact on language, but for frontal temporal dementia, it's often one of the, the primary basic key presenting kinds of change in this temporal lobe that has to do with a lot of either, um, a lot of language that's not understandable. So the thing that it is, but you've got it with the Ghibli and, the other, and lots of words and language that don't necessarily go together or that almost kind of stroke like aphasia of not being able to get the words out. I'm just not being able to get those words to, to motor come out of my mind. Also not understanding written language and, and gesture language sometime as well. Sometimes not, but sometimes as well. The other one that's here is this frontal part of the brain and that's that executive. So those are the things that you don't really get a hold on until you're a grown up. So when you think about what we value in grown ups, it's things like ability to be able to control your impulses, have some self control, make decisions that are not just what's best for you right now, but to have a sense of what you need for the future, to be able to organize things in a way that makes sense, that's reasonable. Um, the other ones that are really important are self-awareness of knowing what I'm good at and when I need help and being aware of other people's um, needs. So being able to see other people's perspectives and, and what's important to other people. And often this shows up in, in various types of dementia as well, Alzheimer's disease, you see some of these changes in executive. For people with frontal temporal lobe, it's really very clear and obvious if that's the variation they have because it's like no filter. And so they'll, they'll say things that are hurtful or, or uncomfortable or maybe even cruel and not really think about hurting somebody's feelings or, or how really inappropriate that is. So they, they just kind of can come out with rude or impulsive kind of language, or if this is the part of the brain that's impacted in their particular type, um, they may often do things 
that they never would have done before. So um, I had a lady who um, her husband had dementia and it was, it was frontal temporal type dementia. And what they noticed was he was in the Hallmark store. He was a retired physician. He was in the Hallmark store and he kept walking up to all the women in this small town making comments about their breast size. Now that was not, so, yeah, right? Paige is going, oh goodness. Um, that was not what they were expecting. He'd been, this, he'd been very involved in his faith community, had a wonderful husband and, and father, and now he's commenting about people's breasts in the Hallmark store. And he, he was just observing and just saying it right out there. And he would occasionally reach out and say, and it, it, it wasn't that he was a bad person, is that this impulse control wasn't connecting anymore. So anything he thought he said, anything he saw, he reached for. And so it gets really um, complicated to be out in public when people are having that variant of frontal temporal lobe type dementia. Um, it can be really confusing for family and for other people around, especially since often people with frontal temporal lobe dementia are kind of on the younger side. So often they're in their, their 40s and their 50s. Um, and so they're at that age where we might blame it on midlife crisis, or we might blame it on um, a new onset of bipolar disorder. And so young people who present with symptoms have a really tough time getting an accurate diagnosis. Many older people presenting with symptoms do as well, but particularly younger people with changes um, struggle with getting those, those accurate, meaningful diagnosis that can lead them to resources that might be beneficial to them. So you've got some information about that as well. So this is the answer to the question. Can you have more than one in the same brain at the same time? And the answer is, as Lisa said, yes. Um, in, in fact, some of the literature says that pretty consistently, um, the most common type of dementia is, is Alzheimer's disease. Pretty consistently, that seems to be true. Um, FTD and vascular dementia and Lewy body dementia, um, it goes back and forth about which one is the most common. And we, we may not have those answers until we get much better than we are currently um, with differential diagnosis. And that's going to probably be particularly related to um, technology and, and how we can visualize the brain and really view the brain and really start looking at changes in symptoms much earlier um, than we when we get to the point of, of really some significant changes. So we might want to start kind of looking at that. Um, so we're going to be really figuring out more about that. But some of the literature actually says that Alzheimer's disease is the most common. And the second most common is likely to be Alzheimer's disease plus something else. So the second most common, if you say Alzheimer's plus any of those other things, that might actually be the second most common. I don't really know that that's true, but I think um, there's, there's a good point that can be made for it, that this idea of, of Alzheimer's disease and something else, or frontal temporal lobe dementia and something else, or vascular dementia and something else, or Lewy body and something else. So any one of those combinations can be possible. And just to make something that is complicated even more complicated, and we may be having a session on this um, later on at some point, is the difference be between you've got dementia in your brain, you can also have delirium and or depression in your brain. So you could have two types of dementia, delirium and depression in the same brain at the same time and talk about life getting complicated. The Having more than one dementia makes it really difficult because if I think about Alzheimer's disease and I'm looking for this nice kind of 
linear progression, slow kind of steady progression, but the person has Alzheimer's disease and vascular dementia. Now I might be seeing more of kind of a small step wise progression than a big one. So it makes it harder to see and tease out. Maybe somebody's got Alzheimer's disease and Lewy body dementia in their same brain. So they've got, you know, these can do it, can't do it, can do it, can't do it. And this mobility stuff and they're having this slow ongoing underneath process. So the, the more things that are going on in the brain, the more complicated it is to understand and to tease it out, to separate it out, to figure out what's going on. But the, the reason why it's important is that we, it's gonna make a difference. So if I am spending time with somebody who has frontal temporal lobe dementia, the kinds of things that they might be changing might be impulse control and ability to plan and some language stuff, but they might have really good, dependable, um, predictable sensory motor skills. So it might be that I can help them spend a lot of time doing things that they can do well burning off some energy, being successful, feeling good about themselves, doing stuff that is physical, and that might help all of us cope better with those changes that are happening to the frontal lobe or um, the language sections. Maybe what I've got is someone who has um, Lewy body dementia, so they're struggling with hallucinations, they're struggling with um, a, a, a lot of those mobility things, but a lot of times they have really incredibly, <coughs> excuse me, um, skilled abilities to express themselves. So maybe that person it has the ability to be part of chat rooms or to be on Zoom calls and talk about what they're going through and give other people suggestions for how to cope. So it's not just paying attention to what the, the changes are, the losses are, but really holding on to what those preserved abilities are. I also, it'll kind of help me stay out of trouble a little bit because if I have somebody with Alzheimer's disease and then I'm expecting things to change like this and I see the person on Friday and when I see them on Monday, it's different and you better get out of here, you hussy tramp and I know you're stealing my money. Then I start thinking that's not Alzheimer's disease. The person didn't have you know, sudden progression of Alzheimer's disease over the weekend. Then I start thinking about, could it be delirium? Could it be um, something like um, a, um, a medication or could it be an infection? Something's causing that pattern to, to change that dramatically. So paying attention that to give can give me um, some direction of when I need to get really distressed, get more information, when this is kind of what I need to be planning for. So I know that with Alzheimer's disease, if the person is um, struggling with a spoon, then I need to be preparing myself to providing them more food that they can eat with their fingers and getting more calories in maybe with things like smoothies and, and less things that take a lot of fine motor skill kinds of things. So that is um, a little bit about different types of dementia, a little bit about how they connect together, a little bit about some of the differences, some of the changes. And so I'm gonna, I've left about 10 minutes, which everybody who knows me is shocked by because I never leave time, but I have been working so hard to give y'all some time for questions. So I'm going, um, to pause for a moment and, and turn to Lisa um, and see if, if you, there are some questions you specifically want me to address. Or if you there are. Them. There are some wonderful questions people are asking. Um, that I could just group and just know they were going to have good questions. You're right. So um, the first thing is going back to Lewy body dementia. How are Lewy body dementia and Parkinson's disease related or are they? Yeah, that's a great question. And they often get confused. And so a lot of times what happens is when people start these mobility problems, people start getting treated for Parkinson's and, and that doesn't always go so well because a lot of times those Parkinson's drugs don't do well for the hallucinations, the thinking problems of people with Lewy body. 
basically they look kind of similar unless you really think about what happened first. So when you turn into a detective and you start, how long has the person had Parkinson's disease? And when did the thinking changes start? If it's been more than a few months, it leads me more towards thinking Lewy body and not Parkinson's disease as much. There's some other changes as well. For example, people with Parkinson's disease tend to have a little bit of a tremor, it tends to be a little bit more on one side than the other. And it tends to kind of, when they do something, the tremor often kind of gets better. So if I go um, to reach for my pen or my spoon, a lot of times once I get the utensil, some of the tremor gets a little better. For people with Lily body, a lot of times, you don't see as much tremor until they go to do something. And then when it's a full glass of milk, the tremor gets really, really bad. So those, those are a couple of little differences and changes. So speaking of those differences, which sounds sort of easy to understand right now, I'm sure they're harder when you're looking at the situation with the person. Um, and you kind of covered this before with the getting a diagnosis, the accuracy of diagnosis. So um, what's the best way or who should we see? Where should we start to get that diagnosis? And you know, does it take a long time? Is it a long process? Yeah, um, I, would, I would start with getting a referral. I, I wouldn't just just start generically with anybody. If you've got a good relationship with your primary care person, your, your PA or your nurse practitioner or your primary care person, and you wanna start there on something like if the person is on Medicare, um, those Medicare wellness, um, annual wellness visit and say, I'm concerned about these things to start the conversation there, um, that's one road. Um, another road that's possible is to start with a referral for um, a, a more of a specialist. And that specialist might be a neurologist, that specialist might be a geriatrician, that specialist might be a psychiatrist. Uh, but start with one of those people to really gather some information, to really look specifically. Start with a referral because not all neurologists are good with, all, with dementia. You know, some of them are great with headaches and not so great with Dementia. Some of them are great with MS, but not so great with dementia. So start with that person who's really great in your community with dementia, whether it's a neurologist, a geriatrician, a psychiatrist, start there. And then the process of diagnosis, brains are complicated and they rule everything else. So the diagnosis is complicated. You're going to do a lot of things to prove what it isn't. So probably gonna start with the physical exam, some lab work, start with some kind of an imaging study of the brain, looking at nutrition, looking at medications, putting all of that together and then seeing which pattern looks the most accurate. So once you get all that information and that information is probably gonna take a period of time to really gather. It's not a one-stop shop, it's gonna take a while to gather all of that information. When it's done that way, the accuracy is probably going to be in the 90%. You know, you, you have a better than 90% chance that this is right. You probably have a really close to 100% chance that it's dementia. It's just what exactly type is probably only going to be 100% when you actually look at brain tissue. And in the United States, we only look at brain tissue with biopsy under some really particular kinds of situations. So that's a little bit about how to diagnose, when to diagnose those kinds of things. The challenge is, so neuropsychologist is, is a reasonable thing, kind of thing to consider. Um, the one thing that's not okay is, oh, she's 92, she's probably got Alzheimer's disease, go start looking for a place. You know, that's, that's the response that's not okay. Um, that's discrimination, discrimination, that's ageism. Um, we wouldn't accept a diagnosis of AIDS for somebody 
um, without an evaluation. We wouldn't accept a diagnosis of ADHD for somebody without a workup and diagnosis. We, we can't accept a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease or dementia in general, non-specified, um, without that good workup. I'm certain to sit in the dark, I'm gonna turn on a light. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, that light didn't help, did it? No, oh. can we just see the light? We can see you okay. So we have so many good questions and I don't think we're gonna get to all of them, we'll try. Um, we understand if people do need to sign off at six o'clock, we wanna be respectful of your time uh, and Melanie's time. We'll try and, and answer a few more if we can in that time and we'll record. Um, we had a question, um, actually Bernie had a really good question about good brain food. If we're trying to take care of ourselves and we know the doctor's gonna look at our nutrition during that evaluation, can we trust those things that are on TV that say this is gonna help our memory or when we're on our phone and a little ad pops up and says, you know, keep your IQ longer or something. What do you think about that? Yeah, I think that food is important. And, and I think that whole food probably offers us more nutrition and more benefit than parts of food. So what I base that on, they've done some study with um, things like ginkgo. And when people who drink um, and um, drink ginkgo teas and do ginkgo supplement, I mean, do ginkgo plants and things like that, it seems like it's got an impact. When we take ginkgo supplements, it doesn't seem to help. So good food, whole food tends to be um, reduce the inflammation process, maybe, maybe reduce some risk. Nothing we have right now is going to prevent. Um, it, it's about really reducing risk. Um, the, the studies that I'm, I'm a little I'm a little suspicious when people only study themselves and don't let anybody else study them. Because I can tell you anything about myself that I want to. Um, but if you don't figure, if I don't show you anything, you, you can't really believe it. So I'm a little reluctant about some of those stuff. I'm more of a believer in whole foods, antioxidants. So that's going to be vegetables and fruits and kind of that Mediterranean diet with the, the nuts and things like that. Less processed food, I think the less processed food, the better off we're going to be. Um, but I think a lot of those supplement kinds of foods, um, I don't think most of them will hurt you. I, I think they probably may really truly help significantly some people, um, but I also think there's a lot more to learn about them. So maybe save our money and eat and more whole foods and not processed foods. Eat more maybe. whole foods. And when I say whole foods, I don't mean foods from whole foods. I mean, you know, because <laughs> I don't get a kickback from whole foods. If I did, I might. Maybe, no, I wouldn't. Um, but but foods that are are a food that is three ingredients or less. It is okay. kind of one of the things. So if you're eating something, I, I read something and it says, if you can't pronounce the ingredients in your food, maybe you want to look for an alternative. Good advice. I met a nurse one time who trains on dementia, Melanie, and she said, if God made it, eat it. And if man made it, leave it. And I thought that was a good way to remember that. Yeah, that's really lovely. I, I heard something that said the closer to the way it came, it came onto the earth, the better off you are. Mm, so I like that. Less, except for tomatoes. And there seems to be something about tomatoes that tomatoes seem to be actually healthier if you cook them. How yes. about coconut oil? Coconut oil is interesting. There are these little case studies where coconut oil does this tremendous thing. Coconut oil seems to be a fairly healthy oil um, to use. We used to think that the palm oils were you know, really dangerous for heart disease and strokes and things. That doesn't seem to be true like we thought it was. Um, so I think there is a place for something like coconut oil. I don't know that it's gonna reverse people's dementia, um, but I think as, an ingredient as something to use. And people who are 
using a little bit of coconut oil is probably not going to hurt you. Okay. We are at six o'clock, so I do want to be respectful of people's time. I know that there are some questions that we didn't answer, so I promise I will ask Melanie those questions. Um, there's uh, three big ones, especially. Um, if you think of other questions when we get done, you have my email address. Um, it's lavine at dementianc.org. I'm the one that sent you the email on how to register or how to get on the Zoom. So please feel free to email me and we will answer those questions. Thank you all so much for being with us. We do have another series with Melanie coming up um, in March, starting March 4th. If you're interested, you can go on the Dementia Alliance website or email me and I'll send you the information. But thank you all so much for being with us tonight. Such amazing questions. And thank you so much, Melanie, for your time. Hi, right, it was fun being with y'all.